Q, Q, Q. This ETF tracks the NASDAQ 100 and since 2016 has seen a 215% gain, but some people are calling it a bad investment. Well, today we're gonna dig into the Invesco QQQ ETF and see what all the hype's about and if it's a good or a bad investment for the long term. So if you're ready to get started, as always, don't be dumb, tap the thumb on the video. Let's get right to it. So first, let's talk basics. And then we're gonna go into how you can make a massive amount of income with the QQQ ETF long-term. And number three, we're actually gonna dive into, wait a minute, is it actually a good investment? Why are people saying it's a bad investment and what do you need to watch out for? As always, this is for edutainment purposes only. I'm just some dude on YouTube that sometimes looks like Woody from Toy Story. This is not financial advice. So instead of putting all your eggs into one basket, such as a Tesla or an Apple or any of those other stocks, why not own them all? That's the purpose of QQQ and ETFs in general. Now, QQQ, ah, can I call it something different? Can I call it Q? Cause I'm tired of saying QQQ. Are we good? Are we good? If we're good, just comment below and say we're good. Q, as of the recording of this video, is going for $373.83 per share. And it's currently up 20.86% year to date. Not too bad at all. What's really nice about Q, in my opinion, is that it's passively managed. And because it's passively managed in the high tech world, it gives an expense ratio of only 0.20%. Of course, that means for every $10,000 that you invest, you're only gonna put up 20 bucks. Now, what's the NASDAQ 100? Well, that's the index that Q follows. Now, with the NASDAQ 100, they they make up a collection of 100 of NASDAQ's largest non-financial companies. Now that being said, Q is tech heavy. And you can see a lot of that based on the holdings. Let's dig into the holdings right now. 48.74% of the ETF is invested in information technology with the largest two of that particular sector being Apple and Microsoft as of the recording of this video. You then have 19.23% of the holdings in communication services, such as Google, Facebook, Comcast, Netflix, and things like that. 17.08% of consumer discretionary, like Amazon, Starbucks, and Tesla. And then 6.72% in healthcare, with most of that actually going to Moderna. And bringing up the rear is utilities at a whopping 0.86%. So that means if you buy into the ETF, you buy one share, two shares, whatever, of QQQ, you end up spreading out that money across the percentages of all of these different sectors. And that's what kind of makes it nicely diversified, but you gotta keep in mind, most of it goes toward information technology, with a lot of it kind of leaning toward Apple and Microsoft. So if you want an ETF heavy in the tech stocks, QQQ, might be your jam. So how do we make the most money? Well, the first tip I have for you out of many is don't freak out when we go in the red. Now, a lot of times these high tech stocks tend to be volatile. They go up and down depending on what's going on in the market and what's going on in the industry as well. So a lot of people will say the terrible term, should I just cut my losses and be done with it? And that's the worst thing you can do, especially when it comes down to tech and innovation. Tech and innovation is focused on the future. They're trying to figure out things that are going to make our lives better long term. And if you're just worried about the day by day and you cut your losses on the red, you might miss a boom that's about to happen. Stay with the person you brought to the dance until the dance floor gets hot. So if I stack up the NASDAQ 100 ETF against two of the S&P 500 indexes, you can see where this really gets exciting. So I'm gonna compare with Portfolio Visualizer, QQQ, SPY, which tracks the S&P 500, and VOO, which also tracks the S&P 500. Now, if you look at this, an initial investment of $10,000 from 2016 to 2021 grows pretty much the same between SPY and VU, as expected since they're both tracking the same index of the S&P 500. But well above and beyond is QQQ growing my $10,000 to an exciting $35,528, which is $11,000 more than VU and SPY. But warning, warning, warning. I'm not saying that Q is better than SPY or VU. Because again, they're two different things. We're talking a little bit apples and oranges here. We're talking about S&P 500. We're talking about NASDAQ 100, heavily focused in tech stocks. But remember, in building your ultimate portfolio, you might want a mix of all these different things. What I always look for are things like those high tech growth type of ETFs. And then look at a steady S&P 500 or a total stock market growth ETF. Then look at some international. And then for fun, look for some bonds. That way you have a little bit of a diversity inside of your ETF portfolio. Now, if you haven't started investing yet, make sure you check out the Webull Investing app. You can get two free stocks when you sign up today. You get your first stock when you open your Webull account, and then you can get a second stock once you deposit your first amount that you can invest in the stock market. 
Get started today, the link is in the description below. Now back to the video. And that leads us to believe, after we just looked at all this, we looked at how things are going so well, with a 215% return since 2016, 20% up on the year. Why are people saying this is a bad investment? Because people, some people are still very worried about big tech. Now, if you look back on the history of QQQ, there's a lot of potential volatility that can happen with this particular tech-focused ETF. For example, in the inception, QQQ, in May 1999, things were looking up. In fact, check this out. Right before the dot-com bubble burst of 2000, you would have been up 122%. If you invested in May 1999, a year later in May 2000, you're like, dude, QQQ is like the best ETF ever. I am up 122%. This is awesome. But then guess what happens? The bubble burst. You may have heard of the dot-com bubble burst back in 2000. And this one, of course, because it's heavily invested in that kind of stuff, went down with it. And then you would have to wait a long, painful, dreaded eight years to finally see green in November 2007, and then followed up by another recession, and then consistent gains 11 years later. That's quite a long time, and some people don't have the stomach to hold on for that long of a time. What's interesting though, if we look back in 2000, when it was just a brand new ETF, we can see a lot of the holdings actually were tied up in Cisco, Microsoft, and Intel. That looks totally different than what they invest in today with their holdings. You may remember, we're looking at things like Apple and Google. The only constant is Microsoft, now staying at the top, and Cisco and Intel getting kind of pushed down on that chart over the last 13 years. Now, worst yet, let's say you invested at the high of 2000, because a lot of people learn about these type of stocks, these type of ETFs, when things are hyped up, when everybody's talking about it, and you invest at the high in 2000. So what that looks like is you have to wait a bloody 16 years to see your portfolio turn green. Now, most of you probably didn't buy QQQ back in those days, but if you did, drop me a comment down below. I'd be interested in how much you made or did you cut your losses and sell at a loss? But if you didn't, and if you're still holding on today, you know you're up 620% on your initial investment. That is well done. So you have to ask yourself, right now as we stand here today, am I okay investing in what some people are calling an all-time high? Or is there room for this to continue to grow, especially with tech and innovation companies? This is where you really, especially with ETFs, you need to dig into this. You need to look into their holdings and see what's going on. You need to look in things, okay, they have most of it tied up in Apple, Microsoft, Google, and things like that. Do I feel confident in those companies? Or are they a bunch of circuit cities and Sears and things like that? That's what you gotta look at. And if you feel confident that there is a lot of runway for these type of companies, then that is something that you can consider when investing in something like QQQ because the goal would be, even if you invested it today, at what some people keep saying it's an all time high, well if it is, you gotta be okay with a little bit of a dip and then you gotta ride it to the promised land. And that is what you need to focus on in looking at the holdings. Are you confident in these holdings taking you up to the next level? You gotta treat investing like a business, not like a roulette wheel. Don't get rich overnight. And guess what? All those people that had the, the pain of the 2000 dot-com bubble, the 2001 9-11 uh, recession, and then you had the 2008 financial crisis, if you just held on through all that, yes, that's a long freaking time. Nobody wants to wait 16, 17, even 21 years. But if you waited 21 years and you sold today, you made 622% on your money. So that's where you gotta kinda stomach it up. Am I okay that if we decide to do this and all hell breaks loose? Am I okay losing the money and potentially holding out for the next 10 years until this thing recovers and then gets me the money I want? But check this out. This might make you feel maybe better or make you laugh. Fidelity recently did a study of the highest returns that they had with their account holders. They found out that the people with the highest returns were all dead. No, I'm just kidding. They were not dead, but they were inactive holders, which means that they didn't actually log into their account. And they were kind of wondering, where are you guys at? You never log in, but man, your returns are off the chart. Well, it turns out that these people forgot that they had a Fidelity account. They literally invested money and freaking forgot, about, literally forgot about it. Like they forgot, oh, that's right, I did, I did that back in like, you know, 2005. Are you kidding me? Those are the people with the highest returns. But I think that that tells us something. The people with the highest returns are the ones that forget about their money. They invest it, they're confident in it, and they let it go, and they let it grow. That is the goal of living the ultimate sweet life because, surprise, you got a ton of money. Here's the next video to check out. Here's a video YouTube thinks you're gonna like. Subscribe for more, and we'll see you on the next video.